Okay, so thank you for joining uh, the Polycon UK webinar. Today we have Vincent Anesi from Luxembourg, who is going to talk, uh, present Cluttering Deliberation. And this is joint work with Mikhail Safronov. Before I hand over to Vincent, let me remind you that these webinars take place every two weeks on Mondays at 3 p.m. UK time. In two weeks, we will have uh, Catherine De Vres from Bocconi. As usual, you can find more information on our website or by following us on Twitter. You can also watch past talks on our YouTube channel. The format of the seminar is as follows. Um, we will have a 50 minute presentation followed by a 10 minute discussions or questions. Um, we request all attendees to keep your microphones muted, um, but please ask your questions and leave comments via chat. Uh, we have a call for Michael uh, who is going to monitor that and, and uh, decide which questions need to be answered immediately or which can be postponed to the Q&A session. We will have a Q&A session in which you can ask questions in person. After that, at the top of the hour, we will finish the official part of the seminar and we will stop the recording. But please, um, everyone is welcome to stay and chat informally for, for, for some other uh, minutes. Okay, um, Vincent, uh, thank you for accepting the invitation and the screen is yours. Okay, well, thank you, Max. And also thank you to uh, Ariana and Francesco first for the, uh, the great seminar series for organizing this and now for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, present our work. So the paper is uh, called Clotering Deliberation and uh, this is joint work with, with Misha will be uh, taking the questions on, on the chat. Okay. Uh, that was working before, it's not work oh, now it's working. Okay, so what we want to, to do in this, uh, in this paper is to study the rules uh, for uh, ending deliberation in committees. Okay, so typically in a committee uh, for a proposal to be uh, put to a vote, uh, you first need a decided group of uh, members of the committee to agree uh, to end deliberation for, uh, for that proposal to be, uh, to be put to a vote. Okay, so we will uh, call this, this rule uh, closure rules. That's the, that's the title of the paper because that's uh, the, the word which is typically uh, used uh, in a legislative body. So uh, uh, one uh, uh, consequence of these uh, closure rules, which we want to study in the paper, is that uh, a proposal may, uh, may fail, not because it is voted down in a, in a committee and as is a standard in, in voting models, but just because it is uh, never brought to a vote. Uh, another uh, uh, consequence of uh, closure rules, which we want to study in the paper, is that uh, in practice they are typically very persistent. Okay, so committees uh, rarely try to amend uh, those closure rules, and uh, when they do, they typically fail uh, to to change to change those rules. So the uh, uh, probably the first example that that comes to mind when you think of of, of closure is uh, the U.S. Senate, where the the threshold for uh, invoking closure on a motion is. Uh, Three fifths of the of the whole Senate, it's sixty uh, senators out of uh, of of a hundred, and a well known consequence of this rule is that um, a Senate minority can uh, prevent a vote uh, on a on a on a bill that has the, the support of a majority just by uh, delaying uh, um, by extending debate. Okay, so this is uh, famously called a, a filibuster, and it is obviously extremely controversial. But despite the controversy in the in the in the past century. Uh, all attempts to uh, to amend this quota to reduce the closure quota have been uh, unsuccessful. So what I want to uh, to stress here is that although this is a, a the, the typical example, the, the, the paper is not about uh, it's not about the U.S. Senate. Okay, our uh, the uh, our um, uh, model is going to be as you as you will see very general, and we can accommodate any type of committee. So when when we'll be using the term committee, you should think of any group of uh, uh, people who have heterogeneous preferences but have to make uh, a collective decision. Okay, so here you have uh, uh, just a, a few examples. So when I, I think of, of committees, it could be an international organization, an academic committee, or, uh, or more, more mundane examples like households or, or even couples. Okay, so what are the questions which uh, we want to address uh, in this paper? Well, first, we want to understand how uh, uh, those closure rules will affect deliberative outcomes, and in particular, whether the committee is able to uh, reach a final vote and to make a decision, or whether the uh, deliberative session is going to end uh, without a final vote. We want to also to see whether those rules will generate efficient or inefficient outcomes, and we will see that uh, 
uh, in some cases of interest, they actually generate Pareto inefficient outcomes. Uh, we also want to study how they affect the distribution of powers uh, among the members of the committee uh, in the deliberative process. And uh, finally, uh, we will also try to understand or to explain why they are so stable, even when uh, they generate uh, Pareto inefficient uh, outcomes. Okay, so how are we going to do this? To, how are we going to, to tackle those, those questions? Well, as you know, there's a large body of literature on, on deliberation in, in, in political economy, in formal uh, political economy, but most of this literature so far uh, has been about information transmission. Okay, so this is a world where you have a committee and each committee member has some private information on a policy relevant state of the world. And it's uh, really all about the willingness of the members of the committee to you know, share this information with the other members. So this is very important, obviously, and very interesting, but we are gonna take a completely different approach uh, uh, to deliberation in this, uh, in this paper. Okay, so we want to think of a situation where uh, actually the committee members are uh, symmetrically uninformed. Okay, there's a proposal to amend the status quo and uh, the members of the committee are uncertain about the merits uh, uh, of, this, of this proposal, whether it's better or not than the status quo. Okay, so they, 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 they don't know there's uncertainty, it's a risky proposal, but what they can do is to think together about whether this proposal is better than the, uh, than the, than the status quo. Okay, they can acquire information, okay, they can, I don't know, conduct hearings, they can consult experts, they can think together. So it's really a, a process of collective learning. And for a while, we, uh, we very naively thought that, we, uh, that this was the first paper to, to take this approach to deliberation. Uh, but then we uh, discovered these two papers, which are both uh, published in the Review of Economic Studies. There is this, uh, uh, first this paper by Bolton and Floyd Grimaud, where uh, they look at individual deliberation by a single uh, agent. And it's a bit the same as in our paper, okay? So she has a uh, there is a status quo uh, situation, but uh, she has a new alternative, the possibility to adopt a new alternative. And what happens is that across a number of periods, she's going to receive possibly some uh, signals, some informative signals generated by a Poisson process. And she will have to decide when she wants to stop you know, learning about this new alternative and make a final decision on whether she wants to adopt that alternative. Okay? Uh, in the context of uh, collective choice, okay, there is this more recent paper by uh, Chen, Lizeri, Swen, and Yariv, okay, also published in the review. And uh, uh, the same, okay, the way they model deliberation is about, okay, over uh, uh, an infinite horizon, okay, receiving signals about different alternatives and at some point deciding to stop and uh, to, to pick one of them. Okay? So, uh, I'm not going to uh, give you a long uh, literature review. I just want to distinguish a little bit our paper from that one. Okay, so their uh, paper is first uh, uh, much more high tech than ours. Okay, so they look at a continuous time model with uh, information is generated by a brown motion. But most importantly, what they do, what they are interested in in that paper is to uh, the likelihood of the committee to make the right decision. Okay, they don't look really at the role of culture. While what we really want to do is to think about uh, the relationship between those culture rules and the co collective learning processes within committees. Okay? And the reason why we uh, want to do this is that if you look at most of the literature on committees and that have thought about uh, the impact of uh, culture rules, the way they model uh, closure usually is just as uh, adjusting the, the value of the voting quota. Okay, so for instance, if you have a majority voting quota, but okay, for some reason the closure rule is three fifths. Uh, of the uh... you muted yourself. Some, some, Sorry, muted. it was my bad because I was uh, admitting somebody and I accidentally uh, muted you. Vincent, I apologize. We've, okay. we've lost uh, too, boring, too boring. Okay, that's fine. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, okay, where was I? Um, Oh yes, why, why, why we want to, to, do, uh, to uh, look at collective learning and, uh, and cultural rules. Yeah, I was saying typically in the literature, the way they model uh, cultural rules is just by adjusting the quota. Okay, so if the cultural quota is higher than the voting rule, they just assume that the voting quota is the cultural quota. Okay, and what we want to show here is that there is more to it. Okay, that uh, uh, cultural rules will also have an impact on collective learning and, and deliberation. Uh, yeah, all right. 
So let me jump uh, into the model. So I, as you will see, the model is uh, uh, extremely, uh, it's really as uh, simple as it gets. Okay, it's gonna be a finite horizon, finite action sets. It's, uh, it's almost embarrassingly simple. So we, uh, we have a finite committee of, of N members, okay? And uh, they will take part in a deliberative session that will last uh, uh, at most T round where, where, where T is, uh, is, uh, is, is finite. Now, uh, deliberation is about uh, deciding whether they want to change a uh, current status quo, which is called uh, capital S, to a risky reform, which we denote by R. So as I said, the, uh, the status quo is safe. So the payoff from uh, maintaining the status quo is known. It's this constant S, which is positive and the same for all committee members. So if they maintain the status quo, they know that they will all receive S. Now the reform is risky. Okay, they don't know if it's a good or a bad reform. Okay, they initially have this common belief uh, that the reform is, uh, is, is good and uh, with probability P0. Okay, that's a, a commonly known uh, probability. And then here comes the heterogeneity among committee members. Okay, they uh, uh, differ in the value they uh, attach to a good reform. Okay, so if the a good reform is implemented, then uh, committee member I is gonna receive a, a, a value equal to VI, okay, which is also strictly positive, and zero if the reform is bad. Okay, so the uncertainty for each committee member I is whether she would receive uh, this value VI uh, if uh, the reform was implemented or zero. Okay? Now, uh, we, uh, we allow for the possibility that VI may be smaller than S. Okay, so some committee members, they might know already that they prefer the status quo to the reform. Okay, they always prefer a good reform, but they might still prefer uh, the status quo to, uh, uh, to, a, to a good reform. Okay, and just for, to simplify the exposition, we will assume that uh, <coughs> we will order the valuations in such a way that individual one is uh, the member with the highest valuation for the reform and individual N, uh, uh, the one with the lowest valuation. Okay, so how does deliberation work? Okay, so when they choose to deliberate, okay, so uh, uh, in each round, uh, what happens? Well, they will receive a signal and this signal can be uh, 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 informative or not, okay, or uh, more precisely, uh, the committee is either going to receive good news or no news. Okay, so that's the standard Poisson learning model. What happens is that if the reform is good, then with probability lambda, Okay, they receive a conclusive signal that tells, that tells the, the committee that the reform is good. Okay? And uh, with probability one minus lambda, they don't receive good news. They receive no news. While if the reform is bad, then they never receive good news. Okay? So they receive good news with probability zero. So at the end of the deliberation round, they can just update their beliefs using, uh, as always, bias rule. So we uh, have here the standard formula that give us uh, the value of the belief after a T uh, rounds of uh, unsuccessful deliberation or without uh, receiving uh, any news. Okay, so that's deliberation. Then what do the uh, committee members do in this game? So we remember we have these T uh, rounds of deliberation. And the first thing they do at the start of every round is to decide whether or not they want to continue deliberating. Okay, so there's a closure vote that takes place. So they are gonna vote on whether they want to either end the deliberation or continue deliberation. If they choose to end uh, uh, a deliberation, then they move to a final vote. Okay, in this final vote, they are gonna vote on whether they want or not to change the status quo to the reform. Okay, so a decision is made and the game ends. Okay, a decision has been made, that's the final decision of the committee. If they chose to continue deliberation uh, in, the, in the closure vote, okay, if closure was uh, unsuccessful, then, there's gonna be another round of deliberation. And as, as I just explained, okay, what happens in that round is that they may or may not receive an informative signal about uh, the quality of the reform. <clears throat> and that's gonna go on until we reach the final round. And if at the end of the final round, uh, they haven't uh, uh, managed to closure the session, then uh, uh, the status quo is gonna be maintained. Okay, so we reach uh, the, the end of the session, no final vote has, has taken place, so we, uh, the status quo is just, is just maintained. Okay, so now uh, I've been talking about closure votes and, um, and final votes, so uh, how do these uh, votes uh, work? Okay, so what are the rules that govern those uh, collective decisions? Uh, 
Well, there are going to be two uh, 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 voting rules, one for uh, closure and one for the final vote. So as I said in my introduction, we want to be um, very general about the way those uh, uh, committees work. Okay, so we uh, take a very uh, uh, general and abstract way of uh, modeling uh, voting. So we assume that to uh, close your vote, you need a, a decisive coalition to agree to, uh, to end the deliberation. So we have a, we define the closure rule as a collection of decisive coalitions. These are the coalitions that have the power to end the deliberation. Okay, and same thing for the final vote. For the reform to be uh, accepted, okay, for the status quo to be changed to the, to the, to the risky proposal, you need a, a decisive coalition to agree to change the status quo to the reform. And again, we uh, represent the voting rule by a, a collection of decisive coalitions. Okay? And because we want to be as general as possible, we impose very little uh, restrictions on those, uh, very few restrictions on those uh, voting rules. Okay, So we want them to be proper. So proper means that uh, if a coalition is decisive, then the complement uh, cannot be decisive. Okay? You cannot have a decisive coalition saying we want to continue the liberation and another decisive coalition saying, no, we want to end the liberation. Okay, otherwise we wouldn't know what to do. Uh, we also impose monotonicity, which says that if a, a coalition is decisive, then, and if we add more members to that coalition, then it remains decisive. Okay, so just for uh, concreteness, some uh, standard examples of voting rules, obviously the quota rules are, the, are uh, uh, the ones that we are very familiar with, okay? So <clears throat> in the case of a, a quota rule with a quota Q, the decisive coalitions are those of size Q, at least Q, those that contain at least Q members. Uh, another type of rules that uh, are of interest, uh, we think in the, in the context of deliberation are the dictatorial rules, because we, uh, in that case, we can think of the dictator, okay, as the committee chair that has the power to decide when the session, should, when deliberation should end and when the committee should move uh, uh, to a vote, okay. Uh, all right, and so that's uh, uh, basically the, uh, uh, what happens in the game. Now, uh, let me turn to the payoffs. So we assume that uh, each deliberation round costs uh, C to uh, each committee member, okay? So every time we uh, go for another round, everyone incurs a, a, a cost of C. And uh, then we get those, uh, uh, those payoffs for each committee member I uh, that are described here. So either uh, the committee voted up the reform in round T. So in that case, the expected payoff to player I is going to be, well, the probability that the reform is good, okay? After T rounds of deliberation, which here is denoted by PT, times the value which is received by committee member I uh, when uh, the reform is adopted and in, uh, when it is good. And because there have been T rounds of deliberation, she incurs a cost of T times C. Okay, so the same uh, uh, logic applies to describe the payoffs when uh, the reform uh, is voted down in round T. Okay, so there have been T rounds of deliberation, so the cost is T times C, but because the status quo was maintained, each committee member I receives a payoff of S. And finally, the last uh, possible outcome is, then, is when the, we reach the end of the session without a final vote. So in that case, the status quo is maintained, so everyone receives S, and because there have been a capital T round of deliberation, uh, 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 each committee member incurs a cost of T times C. Okay. So these are the payoffs, and uh, so what we have is a, is a, a game with uh, <coughs> uncertainty but no uh, incomplete information, so we compute sequential equilibria of this game, we apply the standard refinement of uh, eliminating a, uh, weekly and uh, weekly dominate voting strategies, and we are going to break ties. If I remember correctly, it's when the committee member is indifferent between continuing and ending deliberation, uh, she prefers to uh, end the deliberation. And when she's indifferent between uh, changing the reform uh, to the status quo or maintain the status quo, she prefers to maintain the status quo. Uh, okay. All right, so that's the game. Uh, now uh, let's turn to the analysis of the game. So uh, as always, we, uh, it's, as I said, it's a finite horizon game. It's extremely simple. So we follow the standard uh, background induction uh, 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 approach. So uh, 
let's start to uh, study what happens in the final vote. Okay, so suppose we uh, reach a final vote and that uh, uh, no news has been received during the first T, uh, first T round. Okay, so the belief that the uh, reform is good is PT, and that means that if we choose to uh, implement the reform, then committee member I uh, is going to receive an expected payoff of PT times VR. If instead we maintain the status quo, then she receives S. So she prefers to uh, uh, implement the reform if PT times VI is bigger than S. And because the uh, belief that the reform is good decreases with time, decreases with the number of rounds that have uh, uh, elapsed without uh, receiving good news, um, we can see that there's going to be a threshold T bar, okay, such that before we reach T bar, there is a, a coalition of uh, committee members which is still decisive and uh, optimistic enough about the reform to implement it if uh, there was a final vote. Okay, and after T bar, the belief has been has been uh, has become too low for those uh, decisive members of the of the committee to approve uh, uh, to approve the reform. Okay, so what we have is that, and that's basically all we need all we need to remember from this final stage of the game is that there is this uh, uh, threshold T bar. Before T-bar, we know that if there is a final vote, R will be voted up, the reform will be uh, uh, accepted. After T-bar, it will be voted down. And there is something which uh, is uh, probably the motivation of the, of the paper is that there is some kind of non-monotonicity here. Because before T-bar, uh, it's the individuals with the, uh, with the largest valuations who are the, have the, uh, the strongest incentives to end deliberation. Okay, because before T-bar, if we vote, if there's a vote, then the reform will be in implemented. So it's the people, it's the, the committee members with the largest valuations who want uh, to uh, end deliberation. Well, after T-bar, it's the contrary. Okay, because after T-bar, S would be implemented if we end the deliberation. Those with the highest valuations, uh, in contrast to the previous case, they have the highest incentive to, uh, to continue deliberation. Okay. <coughs> now, um, before we uh, turn to solving the, uh, the general model with uh, uh, for a general voting rule, it's interesting to look at the incentives of a single individual. Okay, so we're going to look at the benchmark case first, where uh, uh, we have a committee chair who has the power to decide uh, when a, a deliberation should end. So uh, we begin with what we call a pro-reform uh, committee chair. So what uh, we call a pro-reform committee chair, I is someone who prefers the good reform to the status quo. Okay, so if she knew that the reform was good, then she would definitely prefer to, uh, to have the reform than, than the status quo. Okay. <coughs> okay. So what is the optimal strategy for this uh, committee chair? Well, if she, choose, if she chooses to start the liberation in the first round, okay, then clearly she should never stop before T-bar unless she receives good news. Okay, because there is no point starting uh, uh, between zero and T-bar because you have uh, incurred the cost of deliberation and uh, you haven't learned anything more than uh, 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 what you had at the start of the, of the, of the session. So it, it's, if, you, if you start deliberating and uh, you don't receive any good news before T-bar, then you should go on uh, uh, and uh, continue deliberation. And when we reach T-bar, then it's a, it's, a, it's a routine to show that the optimal strategy for a single individual is just a stopping rule. Okay, there is a cutoff, okay, which we can call the, the closure cutoff for individual I, TI hat, such that she wants to continue learning until TI hat, but once we reach TI hat, then she has become uh, really pessimistic about uh, the probability of the, uh, the reform being good, and that TI hat, she wants to end deliberation and maintain the status quo. Okay. So that's if she starts deliberation. But actually, she has also the option at the, at the very beginning of the session not to, not to start deliberation. Okay, she can call a vote at the very start uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the session. So what is the optimal strategy for the committee chair where well, we have to compare these two payoffs? The payoffs from maintaining the reform immediately, uh, sorry, adopting the reform, adopting the reform without any deliberation, without any learning, or adopting the stopping rule with a cutoff TI hat. And uh, which one of the two payoff is the larger? Well, there is a, there is a long uh, equation that characterizes this in the, in the paper. Is I've just given you a summary variable, which is delta i of ti hat. Okay, so that's the comparison between uh, 
ending the liberation uh, at the start of the game and adopting the reform uh, straight away, or going for a stopping rule with a, a cut of the IR. Now let's turn to uh, probably a more interesting case, which is uh, uh, the benchmark case of the anti-reform committee chair. So this is a committee chair who actually doesn't like uh, the reform. She prefers the status quo to even a good reform. So for this uh, chair, that's what she does after T-bar is very easy because after T-bar, she knows that if she puts uh, uh, the uh, reform to a vote, it will be uh, turned down. Okay, so clearly after T-bar, she ends the liberation immediately. What is interesting is what happens uh, before T-bar when uh, in particular the committee receives good news. Okay, because if the committee receives good news before T-bar, then she has basically two options. Either she calls a vote immediately, but then the reform will be accepted. Okay, the only advantage of that is that she won't have to incur the cost of deliberation anymore. Or she can choose to let the session end without a final vote. Okay, she can block uh, a closure, what, and that's what we are going to call a filibuster. Okay. So uh, when does she prefer the first option to the, uh, to the or uh, <coughs> I should rather say the second option to the first, uh, to the first one? Well, when the payoff from uh, implementing or maintaining the status quo at the end of the session, but incurring the cost of deliberation till the end of the session, exceeds what she gets if she calls a vote uh, straight away and the reform is implemented. Okay, so basically there's gonna be a cutoff, okay, which is gonna be, uh, I'm gonna call a filibuster cutoff of clear eye, such that when uh, we are in a round before this cutoff, well, we are still too far away from the end of the session. So she prefers, um, to, uh, to call a vote and uh, have the reform, even if she dislikes it. And after this cut off, well, she will, she will filibuster. Okay. So this uh, graph describes the uh, equilibrium uh, uh, choice in this, uh, for this um, uh, uh, dictatorial case where uh, individual I has the power to decide when uh, uh, deliberation should end. Okay, so either uh, the filibuster cut off is beyond T-bar, so in that case, deliberation will uh, end at T-bar if it starts, okay? So we have the same case as before. The only difference is that instead of having uh, T-I hat, which was the, uh, uh, the closure cutoff, now we have T-bar, okay? And there is the option again, okay, to just put the reform to a vote at the start of the session without any deliberation, okay? So again, we have this delta I function that compares the two payoff, okay? The only difference with the, the case before is that now the cutoff is just T-bar. More interesting is the case when uh, the uh, uh, filibuster cutoff is smaller than T-bar, okay? So what happens here? Well, we know that uh, in any case, we will never, we'll never go beyond T-bar because uh, at T-bar, uh, whatever happens, the committee chair will uh, uh, put the, uh, the reform to a vote just to maintain the status quo. But uh, between TIF and T-bar, between the filibuster cutoff and T-bar, if the committee receives good news, then in that case, the a committee chair will choose to, uh, uh, to filibuster. So in that case, we can have a filibuster with positive probability, okay? And what happens uh, before TIF is exactly the same as before, okay? She will continue deliberation. And if uh, the committee receives good news, she will uh, call a vote. And now, Okay, again, we have to compare the payoff of going for that outcome to the payoff that she receives if she uh, calls a vote immediately, okay, without deliberation at the start of the session. So now we don't have a stopping rule, okay, so we cannot use the same delta I as before. There's another value. Again, it's, uh, I think it takes two lines in the paper to describe those, uh, those, uh, those formulas. So I, I haven't put them on the slide. They are not very instructive, but basically, yeah, there's this value delta I F that decides uh, what she prefers. Vincent, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, uh, because I, I, I lost it. So in this sec, uh, the bottom of the slide, uh, there is a point at which if there is the good news, you keep going. What I'm a, a bit confused about is that I understood that the filibuster would go all the way down to time capital T because yep. basically T bar is, is irrelevant there, but your picture seems to suggest that you filibuster only up to T bar. Oh no 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 sorry that yeah I agree my 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 graph is a little bit confusing. 
Okay, yeah, so no, you start now you go all the way to t capital T base. You go all the way to capital T. Yeah, so the when well, no, yeah, the stops here is is only when you haven't received good news yet. Right, right. okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it might, that, I agree that's that's a bit confusing. Yeah. Absolutely. No, you won't. Good, you perfectly understood. That's great. All right. Um, all right, so that's the, the benchmark case. Now let's uh, turn to uh, collective choice when we have much more general uh, voting rules. And uh, uh, as always, uh, for, uh, at least for those of you who are uh, familiar with the literature on, uh, on committees, we are going to have those pivots, okay, which are a generalization of the concept of median voter, but for uh, uh, any voting rule that are going to play a central role as, as always in this kind of, of framework. So here we are going to be uh, particularly interested in the left and the right pivots. So uh, what is a left pivot? Well, uh, it's an individual I or a committee member I with the property that if you look at the committee members who have lower valuation than her, okay, without her, they cannot form a decisive coalition. But as soon as you add this member, they become decisive. Okay, uh, we define the right pivot symmetrically Okay, so we now we look at an individual J such that those committee members who have a higher valuation than her cannot form a, a decisive uh, group without her. But as soon as you add this uh, individual J into the coalition, then they, it becomes decisive. Okay. So uh, again, the standard example is that of uh, quota rules. Okay, so if you have majority, simple majority rule, then the left and the right pivot are the same. Okay, that's a median voter. Uh, if you have a dictator, that's the same. Uh, but if you have a, a larger quota, okay, then you take okay the first uh, Q minus one individuals with uh, who have the, the highest valuation, but without individual Q, they cannot form a decisive group. They need individual Q to uh, uh, form a coalition with Q members. So uh, individual Q is the is the is the right pivot, and uh, we can do the same by starting uh, uh, from n and uh, moving up until uh, n minus Q plus one to get to the left pivot. So it's just uh, generalizing the median voter. Okay, so what happens now in uh, equilibrium? Can I move that? Yeah, I can move that. Okay. Um, so there are three cases of interest, and uh, everything will turn on the comparison between um, the closure cutoff of the left pivot and the filibuster cutoff of the right pivot. Okay. So uh, now the uh, uh, in this case where the filibuster cutoff is very large, okay, what will really matter is when the left pivot is willing to stop. Because when we reach T hat, okay, the left pivot has had enough, okay, she's, she's now convinced that the reform is probably not good enough and that we should stop and uh, take a vote to adopt, the, uh, to maintain the status quo. And if she does so, so do all the committee members with lower valuations. And these coalitions of member L, L plus one up to N, they form a decisive group. So they can end deliberation and ensure that the status quo will be maintained. Before we reach that point, okay, uh, the coalition one up to L, okay, that includes now those uh, players with the highest valuations, but and includes the left pivot, of course, they don't want to stop because they still want to learn. Okay? And this coalition is typically not decisive, but it is blocking. Okay, because now L is, is in that coalition. So uh, until we reach T hat L, this coalition is going to block culture and ensure that we continue learning. Okay. Uh, the same happens before T bar. And uh, as before, it's a bit the same as in, in, with the um, committee chair. Okay, either we let that happen or we just uh, stop deliberation at the start of the session. Okay, we uh, just implement the reform. Uh, without any deliberation. Okay, so it's the same intuition. The only thing is that now the uh, uh, committee member who is going to be decisive to decide whether we do that or not is going to be the right pivot. Okay, so that's uh, the individual that has the uh, uh, among those that have the highest valuations, but it's the last one you need to form a, a, a decisive coalition that can uh, call a vote. Okay, so that's very similar to the uh, to the. Uh, Chair, to the chair to the committee chair case, and that's probably not the most interesting case. Now, filibuster can, uh, or the threat of a filibuster becomes uh, start becoming interesting in the second case, where the uh, filibuster cutoff of the right pivot is smaller than the uh, uh, closure cutoff of the left pivot, and they are both bigger bigger than t bar. 
So now we are not going to stop when we reach uh, the uh, closure cutoff of the left pivot because when we reach TFR, okay, we know that at that stage, individual R is willing to filibuster. Okay, we know that at that stage, if we learned that, uh, even if we learned that the reform is good, okay, individual R will uh, try to block closure and to end the end of the, uh, wait for the end of the session for the status quo to be maintained. And if she does so, so do all the individuals, all the committee members with lower valuations. Okay? So because this is a blocking coalition, we know that S will be maintained anyway. So at that stage, everyone wants to end the liberation because they know that whatever happens, the status quo will be maintained. So it's, it's this, the liberation is pointless. Okay, so you can only incur an, an extra cost of deliberation. Okay. So before that, uh, the same as before will happen. Okay. You still have those individuals with high valuations which still want to learn. Okay. It's only at TFR that they will stop. And uh, as before, okay, there is again uh, the possibility not to go throughout this uh, 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 stopping rule that now has a cut off TFR, but instead uh, end the liberation immediately. Okay. So the only difference with the previous case is that now, uh, the threat of filibuster, although it can never happen on the equilibrium path, uh, it can still affect the outcome because uh, the uh, uh, cutoff now, okay, is going to be TFR. Okay, the, per, the the member of the committee who is really decided in deciding when we end deliberation is is now the right pivot. Finally, the last case. Okay, so as you, as you can see, I've I've decided only to show all the results through, through graphs uh, because uh, that saves the time of explaining uh, a tedious notation. <clears throat> so uh, in this final case, okay, now the uh, filibuster cutoff of the right pivot is more is smaller than than t bar. Okay, so how uh, what will happen in that case? Well, uh, same thing as before. Okay, now we uh, we know that when we reach t bar, everyone wants to stop because we know that whatever happens, okay, the status quo will be maintained. Okay, so there is no point uh, continuing deliberation. Okay, it's just costly, but we won't uh, change the outcome. What is interesting is what may happen uh, between TFR and TBAR. Because now if the committee receives good news between TFR and uh, TBAR, then because we are beyond the TFR, the right pivot now is willing, is prepared to filibuster. Okay, and if she's prepared to filibuster, so are all the committee members with lower valuations. Okay, so R, R plus one, and so on until N, they are willing to uh, wait until the end of the session to make sure that uh, the status quo will be maintained. And because it's a blocking coalition, uh, they are going to do it. Okay, they can, they can block uh, closure and we're going to then uh, therefore have a filibuster with a positive probability in equilibrium. Okay. So the only way to prevent that if, is if at the start of the session, uh, uh, the right pivot prefer to call the vote immediately. And again, you have to look at uh, uh, the different values of the parameter to see when, when, when this is the case. Okay, so this is the uh, equilibrium characterization. Now, what, uh, uh, what have we learned uh, from this uh, exercise? So first, about the distribution of powers in, among uh, committee members. Okay, so we have those pivots. Okay, there's a left pivot, there's a right pivot. And you have all the uh, decided committee members in the middle between the left and the right pivot. But if you look at the equilibrium characterization, you can see that everything is characterized in terms of L and R. Okay. So for any closure rule D, okay, whatever the closure rule is, I can uh, replace it by an oligarchic closure rule where the, two, where the two oligarchs are L and R. Okay. So everything happens as if these two uh, committee members were oligarchs and uh, have all the power and decide when the uh, when uh, the closure uh, when uh, deliberation should end. So I think this is not uh, surprising. What is probably more uh, surprising and more interesting is that if you look at the last case, uh, the, uh, the the case three in the equilibrium characterization, it's exactly what we had in the benchmark case. Okay, with the committee chair, it's except that now the committee chair is called R. So the power to uh, trigger a filibuster can solve the power of all the other pivots, okay? And uh, in effect, makes the right pivot an all-powerful uh, committee chair. Uh, 
right? We get exactly the same outcome as uh, if she were a dictator. <coughs> the filibusters uh, that we have seen in case three are obviously Pareto inefficient. Okay, so they happen with positive probability, but uh, when a committee member, when a filibuster is triggered, obviously all the members of the committee would be better off if we stop the liberation at that stage and maintain the status quo. Okay, so the reason why it still happens with positive probability is because of a standard commitment failure. Okay, the uh, uh, members of the committee who have a high valuation for uh, for the for the reform, they cannot commit not to pass the reform if uh, a final vote took place. Uh, okay. Now, if those uh, closure rules, uh, some closure rules generate equilibria with filibusters uh, with positive probability, how can we uh, solve the problem? Okay, that's uh, what we discussed in the introduction about, for instance, the Senate, okay, reducing the quota. Okay, so one way to avoid these uh, inefficient filibusters is to uh, make it easier to closure the liberation, okay, which means adding more coalitions in the set of decisive coalitions. Okay, or if in the case of a quota rule, reducing the quota. So the start, so that's the standard argument. Okay, so if you, for instance, you call J, J plus one, and so on, and the coalitions, uh, the anti-reform coalition, those, those who don't want the reform to be accepted, okay, they prefer the status quo to the to the to the to the to the to a good reform. Okay, what you can do is that by modifying the rule, for instance, by uh, reducing the quota. Well, you can make sure that the right pivot is no longer in that coalition, and therefore a filibuster can no longer happen. Okay, that's a standard argument. What we show in that uh, in our model is that actually, uh, by reducing the quota or by increasing the size of the uh, uh, the number of the, the set of uh, decisive coalitions, you can reduce the likelihood of a filibuster even if the anti-reform coalition remains blocking. And uh, the reason is, uh, if you look at the graph that characterizes the equilibrium, is that, well, when you uh, reduce the quota, for instance, in the, in the case of a quota rule, what happens is that now the right pivot has a, a higher valuation for the, uh, for the reform. So, which means that she's willing to start filibustering later okay, in the session. And that reduces the interval over which a filibuster can happen with positive probability. Okay, so this shows that when you uh, uh, make it easier to end the liberation, even if the blocking coalition, even if the anti reform coalition remains blocking, it still reduces the likelihood of a filibuster. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, uh, just a few words in terms of also uh, deliberation patterns and in particular the length of deliberation. Okay, so. Typically, we would think that by making it easier to end deliberation, that would also reduce the length uh, of, of, of deliberation. But this is not uh, necessarily the case. Okay, so for what happens when you uh, uh, add more coalitions in the in D when you make it easier to end deliberation? Well, as I said, the uh, now the uh, right pivot has a has a higher valuation, so she's more willing to end deliberation at the start of the session. Okay, she's more willing to accept the reform without any deliberation because she has the highest valuation. But uh, in case two, okay, uh, where remember the stopping rule is uh, the uh, deliberation ends when uh, at the cutoff of the right pivot. Okay, her cutoff now our filibuster cutoff is uh, uh, happens later in the in the in the session. Okay, because she's now. Uh, 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 willing to uh, filibuster later. So it could be that if we choose to start deliberating, then in that case, uh, uh, deliberation will, will end later. Okay, because the point at which the right pivot is willing to filibuster uh, 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 happens later. Okay, so I think I've got something like seven minutes. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do in the final seven minutes is just to give you an overview of what we do in the second part of the paper, which is to use those simple results, okay, and this simple model to look at the stability of cultural rules. Okay, so we want to try to understand why uh, they are stable. Okay, so now we are going to uh, uh, call the set of uh, rules uh, script R, okay, and we are going to think in terms, of, we are going to think of the committee members before the session. If they had a chance to change the, uh, the uh, existing culture rule, would they do it? 
So our first stage, which is uh, uh, not so trivial, is to derive uh, some properties about the preferences of the uh, uh, closure rules, or more precisely, over the possible outcomes of the game. So uh, when you have stopping rules, when the outcomes are stopping rules, that's kind of there's a very natural way of ordering uh, outcomes. You just take the cutoffs. But we have seen that in some cases, in particular when there is a filibuster, the outcome is not a stopping rule. Okay? And in that case, it becomes a bit more subtle to, org to uh, uh, order those, those rules. But still, we have been uh, able to find a linear order with respect to which the preferences of the committee members are a single picked uh, over those, or over those uh, possible equilibrium outcomes. So it's like if we, could, we were able to order uh, equilibrium outcomes of the game on, on the real line. Okay, it's not it's not what it's not the case, but that's as if we could do that. Okay, now uh, stability. So now we look at the a situation where those committee members, okay, they have maybe the possibility to change the existing uh, uh, closure rule. Okay, but now of course we have to decide, okay, uh, under what conditions they are allowed to do that, and in particular, what are the rules that govern uh, institutional changes. Okay, so now we, we initially had a voting rule, we had a closure rule, now we have a third rule, which we call the reform rule, which is the one which is used uh, to reform the existing closure rule. Okay, and we will say that, so if we call this rule bold D, then we will say, see, say that the closure rule is stable if there is no uh, uh, decisive coalition in bold D, which is over, over, willing to overturn the existing closure rule. Overturn means that they can find another closure rule that they all prefer to the existing one, okay? And uh, we will say that the closure rule is self-stable, okay, if it's stable relative to itself, okay, in the sense that no uh, decisive coalition in script D is willing to change script D to another closure rule, okay? So this is a concept of self-stability that was introduced by um, uh, Barbara and Jackson in a, in a 2J paper. And uh, we think that it's kind of very relevant here because uh, rules to change uh, uh, institutions, okay, the way uh, committees work are usually very restricted. Okay, so you can think that if the committee is using a closure rule, then the rule to change that rule is going to be more restricted. Okay, and if a rule is self-stable, then it's also stable with, with respect to any rule which is even more restricted. Okay, so if we feel that it's, a, it's, it's the right concept to use. Okay, so in any case, we uh, provide a full characterization of of this stability for any rule, okay, for any reform rule, we are able to char characterize the set of closure rules that are immune to uh, being changed to another rule. But uh, this is a, a bit uh, complicated and I don't have enough time to explain, but when we look at self-stability, we are able to show that every closure rule is self-stable, okay, which seems to be consistent with what we observe in practice. So this is a, a natural concept when, uh, uh, the deliberation uh, period, the, the, the deliberative session is short, but there are situations where deliberation is over, uh, over a long period. You can think of several days, uh, months, even years. Okay? And in that case, you can think that the committee has the power to change the rules as it goes along. Okay? As deliberation is taking place, okay, you could imagine that uh, if they are not able to uh, reach an agreement to end deliberation, they could think of changing the rules as they are deliberating. So now we look at uh, a, a different approach, okay? We are now going to introduce a stability within the non-cooperative framework. That's the approach of called dynamic stability in the, in the paper of uh, Asimoglu, Egorov, and Sonin in the uh, AR in 2012. And uh, the way we do it is that we keep the same game as we had before, but now at the start of every stage, of every round, before they decide whether or not to closure deliberation, they also decide whether they change the existing closure rule. Okay, so they use uh, the existing rule to uh, decide whether they want to keep the rule or not. Okay, if they do, they apply the, uh, they apply the existing rule. If they change it to a new rule, well, they apply the new rule from now on. Okay. And uh, we're gonna say that the rule is dynamically stable if uh, we start uh, the game with that rule and throughout the deliberative session, it is never amended. And what we can show and using actually the result of self-stability is that every culture rule is also dynamically stable. Okay, I think I'm just just in time. That's that's uh, that's the end of the talk. Ah, great.
Thank you very much. Um, fantastic. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, now we are going to get into the uh, Q&A session. I have a couple of questions, but let me um, let me ask uh, our audience if there's anyone who has any questions or comments. Uh, we had a quite a busy chat exchange, uh, but but anyway, if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and uh, and shoot away. Okay. Um, sorry, okay. I, I have a quick question, a bit following up on your question earlier, Max, about how uh, welfare is measured uh, in there. So um, it, you, uh, Michael replied that it was based on um, just looking at parietal improvements, right? Uh, but one question here is sort of, of that was at the back of my mind is how much information is generated in this process? Uh, and the earlier you stop, the less likely you are that some good news was generated. So that would be thinking about welfare in terms of maybe you know the the value of information to the median voter of the floor or something like that and are they more likely to make the right choice and not the right choice and uh, uh with his rules or without is is that something you've looked at at all or does it not make sense in this uh i would i, I I'm, I'm pretty sure that we looked at it uh but we probably were. I think one of the main obstacles that we uh, that we encountered when 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 trying this ex that exercise uh, was precisely the the issue that you were, were you raising yourself, which was how to define. I mean, what was what is the right criterion? Mm. Um, Who benefits from that information? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's what's a bit difficult with those voting models when you want to do some welfare analysis is that it's typically difficult to get already Pareto inefficiency because it's typically always in voting models, and, and this one is an exception, but in voting models, you often have one, one prevailing decisive individual. Uh, and for that reason, you, you don't get Pareto inefficiency. And going for social welfare, which is, I don't know, some of the utilities or something like that, it's always a bit uh, kind of frustrating because uh, there's no reason why the why the, the preferences of the decisive voter in, 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 that, in that specific setting should coincide with, with, the, with the average individual. Mm -hmm. So I, I think maybe Misha can, can, can jump in if, if I'm also, forgetting something. I think we tried, but we, we couldn't get anything interesting. And part of, part of the reason why we were not able to get anything interesting was mainly because we couldn't get a, a satisfactory uh, criterion. Yeah. Sorry again, what, what was the question? I wasn't listening. <laughs> it, was, it was about welfare criteria. If I may add uh, also another issue here, you know, there is there's a way of thinking about this as uh, the committee being a representative of a wider public in which case you should ignore the cost of waiting entirely and just uh, focus on the expected value of the of the process itself, ignoring the cost of waiting. So that's that would be an alternative. Uh, but then, uh, without cost of waiting, uh, it would be kind of essentially become a voting problem, no? Because if we have finite uh, period of time, then and we already know uh, values or preferences of everyone, then it would be, you know, as if we already arrived at the very end, and so. I mean, there's there's an uncertainty. So basically, about, uh, uh, our time parameter shrinks. We just have voting. Uh, we just have voting. No, no, no deliberation. Well, I, I I don't know because there is there's a there is an issue of of having the right choice. There, yeah, I mean, I mean, an I mean, ante, it's not known. That, 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 that's I mean, one, one thing that would be one criterion which is definitely of interest is uh, the likelihood of making the right decision. Yeah. You know, of selecting the of selecting the reform when it is good and not selecting the reform when it is not good, um, and uh, I, I'm, I remember us thinking about that, but but not delivering probably. Can I, um, can I ask? Um, go on. I'll probably change the topic a second uh, in terms of the. Um, unless anybody else wants to, go ahead. Sorry, Max, were you done? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was I was telling you you to to ask your question. Go on. Okay. So. Um, it's not clear to me that in some situations, so you, you have this thing where everybody more or less has a, an ex ante ranking of preference for this thing. And then the only question is whether you actually get that B or it's zero. 
And I'm wondering whether, I mean, if I were to think about this, I, you know, I would sort of think that actually what's uncertain here, people, you know, the committee members already know what they want or they don't want, but what's uncertain is how um, keen or desperate to avoid the alternative they don't like or to get the alternative they like they are. So the uncertainty seems to be um, more about uh, private rather than a common source of uncertainty. And it could be, for example, how long they're waiting, willing to, to filibuster for. So there's a ex ante, a group of ex members of the Senate that are willing to filibuster for, but it's not clear how many of those X number are gonna peel off after a few days. It might be a function of their constituency preferences, which may be not entirely known and so on. So, I mean, lots of examples, but I'm, I'm, I guess what I'm saying is there might be some uncertainty that is more of a private kind rather than um, a public information kind of uncertainty. Although not is right if you introduce private information, one thing that may be spoiled is whether we have a unique equilibrium or not, right? Depending on how people learn and what kind of maybe off equilibrium signals they get. So it's, I mean, the what's it, what you're saying is nice, but this, you know, will start introducing these issues. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't a model where basically there's people for and people against and the people for and the people against are entirely homogeneous in terms of preferences, except that uh, there's a probability every period that one of them peels off and either, you know, if somebody's filibustering peels off. I mean, have you thought about something like that or is it, because it would be a very different model, but. Um, yeah, I, th I, th I mean, I have to say to, to, be, to, be, to be totally candid, I think we, we thought of a, of a number of variations on this model, including incomplete information. Uh, definitely, we, we thought of that, mm. um, but uh, it just it, be, it becomes very, very rapidly very intractable. Okay. Uh, uh, Having said this, maybe the true answer is that uh, we were just unlucky, and maybe not so skilled to select the right. Yeah, one. Also, we were unaware. So, yes. I mean, so okay. you know, if you can suggest something that, that that's even that, that's even more candid. Yeah, maybe we were not skilled skilled enough. To... Uh, since we no, have no, skill, no, no. but can, can I can, just just to answer. Uh, Francesco, just one thing is that, um, of course, you can you can think of many situations that our model doesn't fit, and uh, obviously it's, it's a very simple model, and we are not claiming that we are explaining everything about filibuster and and closure in any situation possible. But the kind of situation we have in mind and of uncertainty we have is if you think, for instance, of a, a reform of the health system, okay, moving to I don't know from. Uh, improving spending more more money into a public system you can think that some people they don't want that to happen okay they they they, they know they don't like it okay uh, they prefer the status quo okay and but they still prefer uh, they still prefer a good reform to a bad reform okay they still prefer a good system to a bad system um, and you have people who are going to benefit from it but they are not sure okay they they if, if the reform is good and they, they, they definitely need it and they want it, but they are still not convinced that it's, it's, it's better than the status quo. That, that's, the, that's the kind of situations we had in mind. Okay, thanks. Um, we have still a, a minute or two. Are there any other questions? Can I ask, uh, therefore, um, this earlier question that I had in the, in the chat about finite T? It seems to me that in real life, this filibuster, you know, it's only restricted by the fact that there is another issue that perhaps needs to be discussed, but but it could go on in principle forever. Um, so you mean having an uh, you having an exogenous end of the meeting? Or, I mean, an exogenous run, um, a stochastic uh, end of the meeting? No, let, let's start with T being infinite. Yeah, but in that case, it's. Uh... But in that case, that would be sure. morphic to T being there's a commonly understood the end of probability of end of a game in each period, right? Basically. Yeah. Because otherwise, otherwise, how how can you end the re, how can you reach the end of the session and maintain the status quo? Yeah, but you could model it with there's a probability that that you the game ends at in each period. Then 
next yeah. period, there won't be a next period of deliberation that you're going to have to vote. Yeah, there is a crisis and the issue disappears and... Which is fair mm -hmm. enough, but uh, what do you think it will add qualitatively? To yeah, I don't think it changes anything. Okay. Uh, no, uh, no the, guys, incentives, the, incent the general incentives should be the same. No, actually, so no, just to be clear, um, I was suggesting this as a way of modeling what Max is suggesting, which which kind of doesn't contradict common sense. But uh, yeah, no, it, I guess you no. guys are saying it, it, would it wouldn't change the results. Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 <laughs> I'm not, I'm not saying it's stupid, but I'm, I was just saying I don't, yeah, I don't think it, it changes anything. Okay. Okay. My, my intuition here is a bit, um, um, uh, you know, influenced by the war of attrition. In, in a certain sense, this is like a war of attrition, but there is an inflow of information along the way. And the problem with wars of attrition is, you know, what is the final, what happens in the final date? Is there a final date? And the equilibrium selection very often depends on what happens in the final date. So that's the, that's the reason I, I was a bit kind of worried about finite T. Yeah. But again, I mean, the, the difficulty that if you don't have this, this end at some point, at least with some probability, it's difficult to, as I said, to reach the end of the meeting because you, uh, if it's an infinite horizon, you would still be collecting payoffs, which in our case would be you don't you do not collect anything until you reach a decision. Mm -hmm. And even so, with the, so can I with can the, I can I comment on that? Go, go ahead. You have a because you have the cost of information there, you can prove that there is a some point mm -hmm. at which everybody says no. And eventually you can restrict attention to that big T, uh, and that's enough. Yeah, I mean that's if you if you look at this at this at this case uh, the, here here, yeah, uh, you have this ti hat for individual i. Of course, if you take the, the ti hat of the guy with the, of player one, that's going to work. But the, what we are interested in is this are those situations where you what you <laughs> precisely that's going to oh no this one. Well, you yeah, don't. This you know, what I'm saying is that you don't have to take that. So you you want to take a sufficiently long t, and you can prove that c multiplied by that t. Is bigger than the highest V possible, and that strategy is dominated. Uh, that wasn't my intuition because that's that's that you know this is, is that, so I have I have a paper on similar issues and okay. And that's, that's All right, a, Let, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's let's finish the official part of the of the meeting because we are at the top of the hour. So thank you very much for attending. Uh, but we are definitely going to stay afterwards and continue this discussion. Thank you very much, and see you in two weeks. Thank you to everybody. So the